What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. All right. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, another episode of the VB Adrenaline Podcast, and I'm Darren Tipton, and happy to be back uh, with another episode this year as we transition from the club season and into the recruiting season. Not that it slows down, it just kind of enters another chapter of uh, 26s, those that have taken a little bit of time and waiting, and now they're starting to actually get an opportunity to get on campus and take some visits. Um, and then we start talking about 27s a little bit, and now we're actually ramping up for the college season. But uh, with that, I I have an opportunity today to have a conversation with Brennan Dean from Wave Volleyball, and I'm excited uh, to talk with Brennan about a lot of things, um, A, being the recruiting coordinator, um, head of recruiting for that club, one of the top clubs in the country. Um, I made a commitment this year, as I've told my following, to really try and learn more about California, um, just the, the play out there, the athletes out there, the clubs out there. And so I have a lot of questions, um, Brennan. But A, first of all, thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Happy to be here and answer any questions. I do have to correct you, though. I'm not the recruiting coordinator at Wave. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Usually I go at least five minutes before I make a mistake. Yeah, so. It's not me. I have a director of recruitment that works alongside with me when it comes to all the recruiting needs for our girls at Wave. So we, we do have somebody that's position is director of recruitment but I'm also intimately involved in the recruitment process, conversations and things like that. So I'll probably be able to answer all your questions. Okay, so just, not just, the director, just the director of WAVE. My title is executive director of WAVE. And then we also have another director that's over recruitment for boys. We have another one that's recruitment for girls and we have another recruitment coordinator for beach. So we have three recruiting coordinator directors. All right, so all those people, watching this that fall club volleyball for years or laughing the rear ends off at me like me showing my inexperience there so i appreciate it yeah no it's fine uh, and uh uh so what i had set out to do was i had really not followed uh california or for sure the club scene at all and tried to dive in um this year with a 26 class um a little bit and but really watch probably the most at nationals and your your team in specific uh specifically that uh that you coached um the 27s yeah your 27s yes um i just really enjoyed watching them the way they played um so first of all i'll give you a chance to talk about your club but then your 27s team that you coached um most of them fun to coach, but I just enjoyed watching the way they play. So is that kind of the feel for your club in general? Is that the attitude, the way your 27s played? Um, is that the kind of the feel for your club in general? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely a high intensity team. Um, we like to focus a lot on defense and aggressive attacking, aggressive serving you know, being fundamentally sound in all aspects of the game. I, I think that's top to bottom within our club. We're located in San Diego and 
we have boys, girls, and beach, all of them competing at the national level. And we're very fortunate to live in an area where there's a lot of really good volleyball coaches. So right. we have fantastic staff that is really focused on development and um, helping these kids move on to the next level, whatever that next level might be. But uh, specifically to those 27s, you know, it was an interesting group because I'd never coached them before. And we brought in some new pieces from different teams at Wave. We had some kids that were playing up that we talked with and decided it would be best if they stayed with this group um, and played down in their actual grade. Um, we had uh, Ireland Real, who, of course, joined us, who was a big name on this. We had a kid who moved from middle to outside. So there was a lot of adjustments. So at the beginning of the season, we looked very different than the, very, than the end right. of the season. Yeah. And uh, we were fortunate to finish, you know, tied for fifth at nationals in the open division with this group. And uh, unfortunately, took a tough loss in three, not to get into the medal match. But... Um, yeah, I think what you saw is a good reflection of what the club is. I think, you know, our 17s and 18s and 16s are all showing that same type of style while they play. <clears throat> and I will get into more of the, you know, I tech recruiting talk in California and some of your players. Yeah. And so I had an opportunity to interview Ireland, but JC, uh, back we're going to talk about. Um, and that was my first, I'd seen Ireland at NTDP. Um, and just some of her stuff, but talking with her and the vibe, um, uh, a saying that I like to use is when great athletes are great people, it's very easy to cheer for them, right? Um, it just takes them to another level. And uh, I, I think, you know, as you talk at next level of college and pros, whatever, it it puts them on Wheaties boxes, right? It makes them endorsements and everything else, but it also makes them tremendous role models and, and put the cart at the head of the horse. But I just, I, I just got something. And so I kind of just asked around and other people maybe she played for. So I, I just wanted to ask you, we talk about Ireland for a second. Do you, do you sense that? You're in the gym with her a lot. It, does she bring that? you know, that energy, um, you know, for you every day, or is, is that the type of kid you guys see? Yeah. Ireland's a special athlete. I mean, there's not a lot of freshmen that are touching 10, four and that are, you know, six, four, and probably might even grow another inch. Um, she's very humble when she comes into the gym, she realizes that she has a lot to work on and, She's a typical teenager where she likes to have fun, but she comes in and she works really hard and keeps up with the stand for, standard that we're trying to set here at Wave. But what makes her so unique is just how much she loves her teammates. And yes. she celebrates her teammates more than she celebrates herself. She is um, empathetic and caring, and she also is uplifting when things are going wrong. Um, and she's humble. She doesn't go out there and just think that she's the best and the perfect. Um, she wants to get better. She wants to learn and she loves her team and she puts the team before herself, which is a coach's dream. Yeah. And it's good to hear that. I just talk about, and I get that, you know, as we're projecting, I just watch, a lot of athletes even more so like off the court right like yeah and and it's become big with some of the other stuff that's happened uh i i didn't realize how much younger athletes you know the 12s the 13s are looking up to the girls on the big court at the 16s level right like they know the top 16s 17s 18s now and right. i just <clears throat> leadership is important to me. Um, and if these girls are going to look up to them and I'm going to talk to a lot of the top prospects, I'm going to start asking them, I guess, what type of leaders they are. And so when I talk to Ireland that she would never talk about herself. Right. And I know I call them ESPN interviews, right. Where they say like they've rehearsed what's correct to say. 
Right. It wasn't rehearsed, right? It, it, you know what I mean? How you get, yeah, it's authentic, right? I couldn't get her to talk about herself. Like she wanted to talk about JC. She wanted to talk about your team and your coaching and your gym. And 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 um, she talked about Rissa Jones from A5, and, right? Like all these other people. But then I'm like, yeah, that sounded good. Now I'm going to watch her the rest of the week and off the court and when you guys won. And I did see that how she got way more excited for all her teammates than herself. And I just, yeah, the talent is there and that's for way people more, way more smarter than I am. But when I saw all those other things, I'm like, that's a kid that could just separate from a lot of other very talented athletes. Um, yeah, she's, she's absolutely special in that aspect. And yeah. it's something that we do talk about in the gym, but it was something that she already came to our club with, which is when you make a mistake or when things aren't going well, look in a mirror. And when you're being successful or things are going really well, look out the window. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we heard some people were talking about, you know, like the Olympic team. And, and I don't even just mean Ireland. I just mean they were talking about, God, we never focus on Olympic volleyball players when they preview the Olympics, right? And they talk about basketball players and like, well, a lot of times we've been talking about these basketball stars for years. Right? right. And we haven't had volleyball stars for years that we've known. And, but like, that's what we need. And then the right type of stars that just have that it factor. And I get it, but there's gonna be a lot of six, five young ladies that are talented, but six, five ladies that are talented, but, are special right and i just i don't know why that caught me um but i just saw something uh special and again there are probably two million people in this country that know the skill part better than i do um i just thought i'm gonna watch the off the court stuff and so i thought who better to go to than uh the person who spent a lot of time with her this year so yeah you're, uh, you're absolutely right she definitely has that the whole team does and yeah. i think that's one yeah. of the reasons why they're so successful and they had a great season is because they they really do play selflessly and yeah. she fits right into that mold so it's it's great when you know a superstar like Ireland and JC have that. It's yes. it's even better when the whole team does. Yeah, and I don't mean yeah, and, and what brought me to continue that kind of brought me to your court maybe to watch her at yeah. first, and then what kept me at your court was watching about six others yeah. on that team play that way, right? Like that drew me in, which is another I think great point to kids is somebody might get attention, but what you do what coaches are there gets you the attention. Right. And I'm writing names down like, man, I like her, man. I like her. I like yeah. her. Right. And would you maybe talk to other athletes who might watch this um, as sure. somebody follows recruiting, somebody who's been at the big time club scene, talk about how that's a real thing. Yeah. We have seen it for decades at wave where We'll have college coaches that are coming to watch our court because they have some superstar on the team and there's a role player there that makes some exceptional hustle play, is a fantastic teammate, and they get the attention um, and the potential opportunity to get a scholarship or a spot on a collegiate team. I mean, I had a third middle on my team who got a quarter of a million dollar full ride scholarship to a school because of hitting lines. Coach came, was watching <laughs> the other team and they had a player on the other team, saw my kid. She wasn't a starter. She only got to see her in hitting lines. That got her interested. She came into our gym, watched her play in practice, got the scholarship, went on and just a huge success story. So there might be a time where you don't even have a superstar on your team, but there's college coaches that are watching your opponents and you have an opportunity to shine in front of them. And there might be an opportunity for you to play on a team where you're not going to be the superstar, but you're going to get a lot of attention. So I think the kids on this team that you're that you're talking about are 27s. 
there's a lot of coaches that are coming to watch Ireland and JC and like Emery, our setter and our Livia Oppo and our Lib and our middles. And those, those top five, 10 programs might not be recruiting all of them, but they have a lot of friends in the scene. And they're yes. going to be like, Hey, have you seen the lefty on wave or have you seen the libero on wave? Or they're just going to have all these other mid majors that are going to be coming and watching or maybe like 25 to 50 top ranked division one schools that are going to get the opportunities to see those kids. So there's definitely a huge advantage to taking advantage of the opportunity when it's given to you. Yeah. Well, and another thing too, is I loved uh, before I had to fly back, I watched your match. Speaking of that against VCN, um, yeah, Blake. Yep. Head awesome. Coach. Yeah, great coach, great team, really tough serving team. Beat him 15-13 to win pool day two, I remember. Yeah, and so I have me speak, uh, sitting by a coach, but a great match. And you want to talk about that, so you have all these eyes, probably more of them on your side of the net, but they have a little 28 libero. Dug a lot of balls. Yeah. Right, didn't hurt her stock at all. That yeah. she played, and I'm like, I tweeted, I'm like, you want to know? Like, parents are like, hey, how do I get my kid noticed? Well, when you play wave at nationals, <laughs> just play your rear end off, right? Like, yeah. that's how yeah. you do it. Well, we we called a timeout in that match, and I was looking at Ireland and Jay. I'm like, get the ball off the libero. You guys are making her look like an all American. And then I <laughs> talked to Blake after the match. I was like. Your libero just had a hell of a match against us, and he told me that she was young playing up yeah. and uh, was a 28. I was just shocked. That kid played out of her mind. What a stud. I know. Well, and uh, so I did, and I tweeted oh, my friends, you know, to get the name, and he also knows, you know, quick trigger, I can be some He's like, uh, yeah, and before you uh, tweet about her, she is a 28, right? Because he knew yeah. I had the highlight, was ready to pop that out. And, like, the coach I was sitting by twice was like, oh, oh, like elbowed me like, I'm like, yeah. I'm yeah. Like, I know. So that, that's how you do it, guys. When it's like, yeah, you pay to go all these camps and you can do all this stuff, but hey, when you get the chance, perform. Like you never know. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. That uh, yeah. So I love that. Um, and yeah, dorks like me write all this stuff, and we only have so many hands and stuff. That doesn't do it, right? It's still it's the old fashioned way. Uh, you want to get recruited, prove it on the court when somebody's watching you. Right. Right. That's I'd still say that. Isn't that probably the best way to get recruited? Yeah, And you never know when you're being watched. Yes. So, like I, I have college coaches to tell me all the time, like one of the things that I'm looking for is what you do when you're on the sidelines and what Amen. you do when like mistakes happen. Like when you run out of water, are you going to get your own water? Or do you have water in your backpack? Or are you yelling at your mom and dad Throwing to get it. water? Oh. And water? <laughs> and not asking like using please and thank you like simple comp like simple things that we expect but are you entitled or are you grateful what are what side of that line are you going to be on and, and tell me if i'm wrong on this i call it um i call it uh uh skill um continuum right unfortunately the higher you up are on that or the more they let you get away with that stuff. But I'm like, hey, if you were somebody like me, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it still is. They let you get away with it. But I'm like, hey, I always say it's like, hey, that a wide receiver that runs a 4-3 and a 6-3, they let them get away with more dumb mistakes than the walk-on free agent receiver. Um, You get one chance, right? So, I mean, yeah. I see what you're getting at. I think that it's coaches' responsibilities to teach our blue chip elite athletes how to <clears throat> develop a work ethic, behave appropriately, <clears throat> yep. things like that. But as a coach, you're going to give your blue chip elite athlete a longer leash than you are your kid that's still developing. And that's because of what they've proven in your gym to earn that longer leash. And, you know, Ireland maybe got dug six or seven times by that elite libero, but I still wasn't going to take her out because I know that she could score against that kid. We just had to make some adjustments. She had to work through some things. And I think at the end of the game, probably when it was like 13 all or 12 all, she came up with some pretty big kills 
and was able oh. to win that libero. Yeah. Five ten wide receiver who ran uh you know five six forty. I got one drop a game. Um, the six <laughs> two guy that ran a four six, he got to drop three or four. I didn't understand it when I was 17. <laughs> I get it, right? Yeah. Fair yeah. doesn't equal him, right? Yeah, so good. Go, I, I love it. I'm jacked up now. I'm pumped. So tell me, we can talk more. Um, and I hope we get to talk more about more of your kids because you don't get that far in nationals without having a lot of talented kids. Yeah, let's go on. Just I want to touch on the 27 class in general on the west coast you know california arizona obviously um you know rba also and storm but talk about in california um because yeah. wow is their talent yeah and it's it's up and down too i mean we had vision from northern california coming to our gym and do a scrimmage before nationals. And they've got a great little squad with some really strong tens. I was impressed by that. And then the Arizona's, of course, you got oh. AZ Storm in the finals, led by the great <coughs> fan. I mean, just a fantastic team. T Street right up the road with Megan Hodges, who's a, who's a 28 playing up, who's <laughs> a phenomenal player. You got Olsen on the outside that just carves people up with her beach style of game. Um, Wave is obviously top eight. City yeah. did a fantastic job this year and really improved. They have a lot of size. Um, Steph, fantastic coach up there. Got her team past us in the medal round. But then you get to look at both Forzas. You got Forza North with three yes. middles that all touch above 10. You got Forza one with one of the best setters in the class. And you got Long Beach that's, you know, loaded and pushes us every single time that we play them. It's it's a really, really strong and I'm and I'm forgetting a couple as well. But I mean, it's rare that I can say Southern California is the strongest region in this age group. I usually always have to defer to Texas has the strongest region, 17s yeah. and 18s, et cetera. But I think that I could argue that Southern California has the strongest age group in probably a long time in this particular class. And uh, I talked to a uh, college coach, or your name uh, remained nameless, but he's a little ticked off. He said, we got to dig in. Um, it's time to close the borders. We got to keep them home. And <laughs> a little upset. I said, yeah. well, they're keeping kids home anymore with all the, you know, the national recruiting is like, no, um, next year we're going to dig in and keep them home. Meaning, you know, you got the big 10 now with, you know, the, the four schools go to the big 10. He's like, we got to have a big year. Um, we got to have a big year next year, keeping those West coast kids um, locked in. I'm like, yeah, this would be a good time. This would be a good time. So it's going to be, interesting but that's gonna be the place to go and uh um make some of those powers at least spend some frequent flyer miles um to go out there so it's a class that also has a lot of size which is a, which is pretty unique for southern california but i mean you got with ireland at six four megan around six five yeah. city's got a couple six four plus kids it it definitely has the potential for big 10. it'll be interesting to see what usc and ucla does with travel and what that's going to look like to some of their competitors um mm -hmm. you know, that private charter flighting flights are just so appealing for kids but staying close to home is huge i mean it's not going to be too shabby staying in this weather but also being able to compete for a national championship and play in the best conference in the country not i mean put you on the payroll right now that's a nice little pitch that's I, that's what i'd be saying yeah. i I love those schools. I grew up, still live in Big Ten country, but uh, I'm going to tell you, January when the BTN shuts their cameras off then, at least for volleyball, that you need a different kind of jacket. And I, I'm just telling you, you need a different kind of jacket. Um, yeah. and, and, and I live here, but uh, it, it is different. And that's why I grew up a Golden Gopher uh, football fan all these years. And uh, we never got kids from like California because – that's what happened because we recruited in February for crying out loud. But uh, 
<laughs> but um, let me ask you this. As on the recruiting side of things, what do you look at? Because obviously there's been changed the last couple of years. But with the conference alone, which you just touched on, right, that there's change. It's a year of unknown right now. There's going to be a year of discovery. But now the new changes that are coming, um, you know, with uh, um, the new scholarship and all the, the talks. But then the year that was with these, you know, the 26s and the talk of calendar and what what are you guys thinking as on the club end as educating prospects like what's going through your mind as you're you know what i mean like what yeah. are you guys thinking on a club yeah. end of things on the education side yeah so this 24 season is going to be really interesting for the us to watch at the club level um at, to see what the colleges are going to be doing so with the roster size changing up to 18 uh, therefore, lead, leading into those 18 scholarships, if they divide, if they decide to, you know, go into the rev share model, I think what we're going to see a lot is just the haves are going to get more, the have-nots are going to get even less, but there's still going to be a great home for kids of all levels. Right. And I think you know our stud blue chip kids that are going into the power four conferences, those kids are going to have some unique things that we're going to have to figure out when treading this water, when it comes to the rev share, when it comes to scholarship, you know, are we going to see these liberos that are going to be full ride kids, or are they going to stay in that walk on two year out of four year potential, except for the extraordinary ones that, you know, get the four at Nebraska. So that'll be interesting for us to watch. But I think for the majority of our athletes, really nothing's going to change. They're going to still stay in that mid-major range. The recruitment system isn't going to dramatically change. They're going to continue to probably stay with their 12 scholarships, the most that are fully funded. Um, and those that world's not going to deviate as much. I just think that those power four schools are really going to be um, – we're going to look at it in a different lens. How about the uh, the calendar part? Um, do you see what were your thoughts maybe on this year with so many kids committing extreme or verbaling extremely early? <laughs> yeah, I I'm gl I'm glad you brought that up. And sorry if you asked that and I didn't answer it. The no, calendar no. is very different. Um, this year there was a huge increase in kids that committed early. I attribute that to families, kids with the help of clubs and recruiting coordinators, facilitating homework being completed early and them being more prepared. You know, the year prior, we were still getting used to the system and experience. Let's wait and see. This year we had much more time to do due diligence and to guide our athletes. And I felt like the three kids that we had that committed in the first couple of days were well-educated on their decision, were thoughtful on their decision, didn't feel rushed in their decision, um, had many, let's talk about it and then let's sleep on it. Let's talk about it and let's sleep on it. And I'm really happy with all of the decisions that our kids have made this far. Thus far, I think the change that we're going to be seeing in this new recruiting calendar has great benefit for a number of different reasons. And I'm sure there's a lot of negatives that come as well. One of the great benefits is being able to develop a rapport with coaches before actually committing, having these conversations and the coaches being able to make an assessment of the kid and the kids being able to make an assessment of the coach to see if that's going to be a good fit. Where before, <clears throat> these college coaches were just relying on recruiting coordinators to be like, what type of kid was it? And it's, and it's hard for us to say, like, yeah. 
any real like helpful information. I mean, like we obviously like the kid, they play for us. Yes, there's a couple of like extreme outliers where we're like, hey, I don't think the personalities will fit. But most of the time, we're just giving generic information. You're, she works hard. She's a great athlete, blah, blah, blah. But um, now them being able to have that conversation is going to make it even easier for them to make a decision on August 1st when they're able to get that. And I don't think it's going to make August 1st as um, a questionable day for some athletes. They're going to have a better understanding of what to expect as far as phone calls coming in, offers coming in, because of the interest level and the frequency of phone calls and connections and how those conversations have actually gone. So I think that on August 1st, someone can, with a good educational guest, be like, I expect this mid-major to reach out to me because I've talked to him once a month for the last you know, six months. And we've had these great relations and they've talked about general interest and things like that. And I'll make June 15th um, experience that our recruiting coordinators and our families have had hopefully be much easier now that it's August 1st. I also like the time. I like that it's after nationals. I like that it's after the tryouts for most of the club systems. So that's not going to have the additional pressure and energy surrounded by it. Now, I know that there's <laughs> a negative aspect that a college coach's fear of college coaches cheating and offering players accepting, keeping it under wraps, it not being exposed until August 1. I'm the optimist that just believes and hopes that colleges are going to follow the rules, just like the majority did this year. We really just saw everyone stay in that. I have general interest. I have general interest. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be a good adjustment. I think that it was hockey that potentially piloted this calendar and this recruiting system and, you know, help of the ABCA and the NCAA passing it for volleyball. So I, I'm looking forward to it. I think there's some good things in there. It better, yeah. And so maybe more the everybody announcing or a ton of announcements right on August 1st is what they're fearing, right? Like the the ones that stretch the rules would be right. would be then, yeah. Um, and is there ever a hope that we get to a point where a majority of these kids can actually take visits or are we just not going to – is that just – not really in the cards for volleyball. I think that there are kids that are taking visits. I think that official visits um, is rare in our case. Yeah. We see a lot of kids that are visiting campuses by attending camps. So they're getting on school, they're getting to see the campus and experience the gyms, but the official visit is maybe going to be difficult for our sport to get to, but yeah. who knows? And yeah, it's great to have that paid five visits to go and see it all. Um, but it's worked so far. Yeah. Well, I, I just wonder, and, and to get off because you, you have to talk to a ton of alumni. I mean, way more than I would think I do, right? I just, there's so many college athletes that I talk to, and not ones that are in the portal. But just even, and if I say to them, what would you do if, you know, when you look back on your recruiting, I mean, I want to say it's a 95% answer. Take more time. Yeah. You know, and like, if they're all saying that, that, that's just my head scratcher. If they're all saying that, why are we not, I'm not listening. And not that they'd make a different decision, like to me, it's like these guys are all telling us that. That's my only. That's my it, only. It's, it's a teenage brain, you know. They've got this huge monumental weight on their shoulders of work so hard, get the scholarship, get the commitment to college. Then they get to the finish line, and the last thing they want to do is take more time getting this monumental weight. Right. Off their shoulders. Yes. And their brains are still developing. They yeah. don't have the frontal lobe that's developed that can understand the foresight and future and processing. So they don't realize how these decisions right now are going to dramatically affect them in their four years of college. So 
it's it's an uphill battle for all of us adults to like educate these kids of like wait 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 take your time let's make sure we process all of this information when all they want to do is get this huge to do checked off the box yeah that yeah i very very well put very well put what would you say on the when you hear about um the you know like the hard timelines how do you how do you guys talk to your athletes about hey you because i hear two things if they really really want you they'll wait and then i hear the hey you got 12 hours or we're moving on so you know from a nationally ranked very big time club that have had all americans i hope yeah, you know, it's very rare for us to get those type of timelines. Really? It is. I don't get, um, we don't hear a lot about them, thank goodness. So I, I have heard about, you know, top 10 schools in the country that are offering three kids the same spot. And the first one that says yes gets the spot. And you know, they're in a difficult position, these head coaches, where sure. their livelihood, their families, mm -hmm. you know, rent and or mortgage, but, you know, food on the table relies on them winning. They need to be, they need to make sure that they don't miss out on a top position. So right. they're, they're feeling forced and pressured into doing it that way to ensure that they stay in that top 10. Um if it's a mid-major that's throwing that out, um, that would be very surprising and shocking. And I think it's fine when colleges say like, hey, you have a month, you have three weeks. That type of, that totally makes sense to me. But when we talk in hours or if we talk in first come, first serve, um, it's frustrating and it's hard to guide an athlete through that process. And that's where you really hope you kind of do the homework. Yeah. And... You hope that they're prepared, but we've been fortunate enough a wave where we haven't had an athlete that has been given that type of scenario. And then we feel like we've made, or they've made the wrong decision. Yeah. I, that, well, that's refreshing. That's good. Um, good to hear. Cause I never know what our, you know, big rumor mill stuff that I'm hearing or what's completely accurate. And, and especially with this year, I thought, you know, I was hearing a lot more of it and um and and I and I completely get that what you're saying from the coach's perspective they have to land one right and yeah. they miss out on one of two or two of two they're hurting right um I I get it I just wonder how the best way to advise a 15 before they're a 16 like this may happen and when it does how do you react um yeah you know, we we have, I would say, 1% or less that are giving us like hourly deadlines or you have one day deadlines or we've offered three first one first serve. That That is so rare. And the other thing that we have less than 1% of is NIL deals with the scholarship offers. Yeah. So, you know, it's a big discussion point, but it's not happening very frequently to most of our athletes, if not all of our athletes. Right. Yeah. And I would agree. And thank goodness. Um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're not down that road. Like, uh, yeah. you know, like the weird shape ball is. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> what do you guys, so with your club and it kind of leave you on this and first of all, thank you, man. I have learned yeah. as I thought I would um, from this, I have learned a ton, um, but uh, so your club, um, are you guys now as you know, college goes back and the high school, the prep seasons get rolling individual lessons, youth, what, what are you guys focusing on now? Yeah. So right now we had just wrapped up our high school age group tryouts. So our 15s through 18s teams have all been formed this last weekend. And we are now focusing on our boys tryouts that are coming up our middle school tryouts that are coming up and we're wrapping up the very end of the competitive beach season. And then we'll go into a 
fall training model. So we've got a lot of middle school camps, um, workouts and privates, and same thing goes with our boys side. And then Beach is mostly traveling, um, headed up to Newport, Hermosa, Manhattan Beach, competing in those national tournaments and um, having a great, great summer. <laughs> wow. Well, I thank you so much for letting me learn, uh, you know, more about you, but your insight. And I had heard on the tour, I guess, that uh, you were uh, one of the best to talk to about some of these things and uh, need to get a cool. different uh, perception. Yeah, well, cool for you for earning that uh, earning that respect, man. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it every day. So well, we're, we're trying down here. We, we aren't perfect. We're not doing everything right, but we're trying to get better every day. That's kind of our motto. Well, that's my motto too, man. And I, uh, I, I appreciate the the people that uh, aren't afraid to uh, give me uh, constructive criticism and and tell me the right way to go because I'm uh, I, I'm learning and taking notes too. And and uh, it's hard trying to promote the sport, but also educate kids and and just make the experience better for them, you know. Um, yeah. Too, but uh, um, and. And too, I get locked in too. I, I love how you say some of these problems are one percent problems, right? And they're we got to remember that there's a ninety nine percent that aren't yeah. dealing with this, these things. Um, yeah. um, but there are kids that still deal with them that uh, that we're talking about. And uh, the cool thing is, I think there are a lot more opportunities um, and bigger opportunities than than there were for a lot of girls uh, five and especially 10 years ago, um, I agree. you know, with our sport. So, well, Brandon, man, thank you for your time. Um, keep crushing things out on the coast and, uh, you, uh, those recruiting, uh, coordinators out there that are, uh, get their cell phone batteries charged up. So I think, uh, uh, next year, those phones are going to be going crazy uh, if they don't every other year. But uh, thank you for your time. Brendan Dean from Wave Volleyball and uh, very, uh, very uh, top-ranked program, and things are going great out there. Um, and the weather's pretty cool out there in San Diego as well. So, that, that, it, 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 Yeah, you bet, man. Great to meet you. And everybody, All thanks right. again. Another episode here of uh, VB Adrenaline Podcast. Follow us on social media as we continue uh, to rebuild our Instagram account that got uh, hacked in March. We rebuild it one loyal follower at a time. And again, uh, if you haven't seen, we're lucky enough. Amy Pauly is going to join me. We're going to be at the First Serve Classic uh, doing a live show from the Team Hotel on Monday and then right from the uh, KFC Young Center. Uh, Yum Center on Tuesday for the ABCA First uh, Serve Classic. So join us there. We're pumped about that. And until we see you next time on another episode, I uh, I just appreciate every follower we have. And uh, we'll be back with more soon. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>